Now we're going to go over the normal motions of the foot, starting with plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. So plantar flexion is an increase of the angle of the top, the dorsal aspect of the foot, and the tibia. So this angle will be increasing. So as you can see, pointing the foot down, this would be plantar flexion. Dorsiflexion would be a decrease in the angle of the top of the foot and the tibia. So moving the foot back, angle is decreasing. This is dorsiflexion. Now a key point here is when testing dorsiflexion, you want to make sure the knee is bent. Otherwise, the tension of the gastroxoleus muscles here will actually limit your dorsiflexion. Now we'll be demonstrating inversion and eversion of the ankle and foot. We've got Mickey demonstrating here, so we'll start with inversion. And now moving in the opposite direction is eversion. And now we'll have Mickey move back and forth between the two. Inversion and eversion. Inversion again and eversion. Now we'll be demonstrating abduction and adduction of the foot. A few key points. We're doing this in a lying position, a supine position, so that we can eliminate any rotation that may occur at the hip joint. We're also going to palpate with our fingers the tibial tuberosity to make sure that the tibia is not rotating as we're doing this, so we can get a true representation of abduction and adduction. So Mickey's going to demonstrate starting with abduction. Good. And then adduction. Good. And now he's going to do that a few times. So once again, abduction, adduction. And one more time, abduction and adduction. Now we'll be discussing supination, then pronation of the foot. Supination is inward rotation of the ankle, adduction of the hind foot, inversion of the forefoot, and medial arch elevation. During supination, the subtalar joint moves in three planes simultaneously. Adduction, inversion, and plantar flexion. And we'll have Mickey demonstrate this a few times. It's important to note that during the normal gait cycle, you'll be going in and out of supination continuously. So you'll be going in adduction, inversion, and supination. Adduction again, inversion and plantar flexion. Same thing, adduction, inversion and plantar flexion continuously. Now we'll be discussing pronation. And it's important to understand that pronation is biomechanically the mirror image of supination. So the foot will first go into abduction, eversion, and dorsiflexion. And we're going to have Mickey repeat this motion a few times. So abduction, eversion, dorsiflexion. Yeah, abduction, eversion, and dorsiflexion. Now it's important to note during the normal gait cycle, your foot will naturally alternate between pronation and supination continuously. So we'll have Mickey demonstrate. Supination, pronation, supination, pronation. And for the purpose of this video, we are exaggerating the movement somewhat. Pronation, supination. Seeing as we're talking about pronation and supination, I think it's really important that we look at the posterior of the foot and its relationship in terms of the calcaneus and how the calcaneus moves in different positions. If it's leaning to the outside like this, this is what we refer to as hind foot varus. If it goes inwards like this, this is what we refer to as hind foot valgus. The varus position is related to supination. The valgus position is related to pronation. 
Now, if we find that it's actually very rigid and restricted in its position, we're going to have problems with the outside of the foot. As I'm tilting this out to the side here, you'll notice that I'm also tilting the tibia, tibia and fibula. What that will do is it'll cause a bowing of the legs and a lot of stress on the outside of the joints. If it's going into the inside here and rolling in, it's going to increase pronation or cause hyperpronation. This will cause considerable problems in terms of soft tissue injuries, medial part of the knee, all the way down the leg on the inside. Also, the adductor muscles will be affected greatly. So one of the things I want to show is just putting the model besides Mickey's foot here and show you that we have the calcaneus go into the varus position, how it leans over, and also into the valgus position over there. Now obviously we're exaggerating this just to show you, but let's go back and forth there. But you can see when we go to the side there, all the different structures that have to move to compensate. And it's important to remember that most of this motion is happening through the subtalar joint. Good, excellent. So one of the things I want to talk about also is the compensation that takes place in the forefoot when the calcaneus moves into the varus or into the valgus position. If we're looking at the hind foot varus position, which a lot of people actually go into, there's several compensations that can take place. At the beginning of the foot, we could actually have the whole thing just tilt to the side, and this would be referred to as forefoot varus. What can also happen is actually the front comes down here like this, and it kind of torques over like this a bit. I'm exaggerating. And this is what we refer to as forefoot valgus. The type of compensation we see will vary greatly. For some people, if they're on the side like this all the time, and they have this forefoot varus, they'll notice they start to develop problems in the fourth and fifth metatarsal here, or lateral problems, in addition to the other compensations further up the leg, in the ankle and the knee. If the foot is down here, we go into this valgus position on the forefoot. This is so we can try and make contact with the ground for push-off. But, as I mentioned, the type of compensation will vary greatly between people.